So we've set up the Bing Webmaster Tools. We've set up the Google Search Console. Now the third thing to talk about is Google Analytics. So that's the one that's more famous. You usually hear about Google Analytics much more than any of these other ones. And so we'll take a moment to set this up now. On my handout, notice I've got direct links to all of these. There's the big one down there. We were just at Webmasters, and now we're going to google.com slash analytics. So on your web browser, go ahead then and go to google.com slash analytics. A-N-A-L-Y-T-C-S, google.com slash analytics. This is, the, this is the big, famous, and powerful tool, and it needs a little bit of setup also, just like the other ones, verification, and so forth. So we'll go to google.com slash analytics. It'll ask you on the top right to sign in. But before that, there's analytics premium, anometry analytics, analytics for mobile, and tag manager. Again, the they're going the opposite way. I thought they were going to start to consolidate all of this together, and now they're further spreading it out. So I have not researched it, and I keep telling myself I need to do this. There's only so many hours in the day. I don't know what Google Analytics Premium is compared to regular. I've used Google Analytics for years and years, and sometime in the last three months or so, they created Google Analytics Premium. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know if it's worth it, but cynically I have to say probably. It's probably worth it to get the paid one. That's always better. But in this class, obviously, we'll talk about the free one. And Adometry, I don't even know what that is at all. I haven't I never used it. So there's Adometry. Analytics for mobile apps. You might have a mobile app, especially an Android app, and you can also track a bunch of data about your app. And then Tag Manager, that's related to those keywords that you research and that you buy. So all of these different sites for all of these different concepts instead of integrating them together. And I can understand that if they were all integrated, it would be hard to manage. But here now, you've got to remember, you've got a completely different login for one thing and another login for another thing and another login. I sort of feel that I would just like it all in one place instead of spread out on different sites. But anyway, when you go to googleanalytics.com, uh, when you go to google.com slash analytics, I mean, then you can click on the top right corner, sign in to Google Analytics. On yours, most likely, it's going to show you a screen that has three icons and a button that says Sign Up. It shows you that even though you already sort of have it, but go ahead and click that button. I think it says Sign In or Sign Up. It's got three icons. Sign in. Go ahead and click that. Again, mine looks different, but click your button on the right side. It says step one, two, three. Click on that sign in step. And then you'll see a screen that looks a little bit more like this. Do you see new account? The thing that's confusing is it uses the, the word account in a different way than you might think. Look at mine here for a moment. I'm logged in with my company email, and I manage, along with others, the Google Analytics for all of these clients. So for me, it makes sense that I have different accounts. I'm managing the LC Codings account. I'm managing the Redbubble account. So that screen, it's asking you, what account would you like to create? Basically, think of them as folders. I've got a folder for this company, and a folder for that one, and a folder for this one. Each website, each company has its own folder. It has its own account. That's what it's telling you there on that screen. And inside of an account, I then have various properties. So in that account, that folder, I have the YouTube property, the main site property, the other YouTube property. And so, when we're creating this, this item here, that's what it's asking you. You're going to track a website, yes, 
what's the account? What's the name of the folder? So whatever the name of your site is, it's just the name of the folder to organize it all. You can have spaces and capitals and everything you want. The actual property, you're going to have a website, your home page. What do you want to call this? You can call it website, my website, the home page, anything. I'm going to call it main site because later on I can set this up to also track the YouTube, track the blog separately, track the shopping cart separately. I can have multiple things that I can track. Those are properties. <coughs> and then I add the address, either, H either HTTP or PS version secure or not, and this one doesn't matter if you put www or not. Industry category. For this one, uh, you can choose whatever you want. I sort of recommend to choose other, even though if you've got an option that fits. And the reason for this is because Google Analytics collects so much data and if you select one of these industries, it's going to try to show you some things that would be most relevant, it thinks, to your industry. <clears throat> if you want to see every single option, every single setting, you go to Other, and that'll show you everything. It might be too much. So as you get more acclimated with it, perhaps Other would be useful. But if you're starting off, you know, if you're a realtor, which of these would work under Realty? business and industrial markets, some of these, so, you know, where, where would Realty fit in? Jobs and education? Oh, right there, real estate. So there is real estate right there. So that, in theory, should show me all of the data most relevant to a realtor. It does mean, then, that some things are not active. I've taught this class several times, and some people then say, I'm, I don't find the thing that you're looking at. That's because they set their industry category to a, to a view that does not have every setting. To get every setting, it's under Other. Check your time zone to be correct, and then we have all of these data sharing settings. It doesn't hurt to turn them all off. It's on or off, doesn't matter, but what's happening here is it's asking, would you like to share the data that we collect on Google Analytics to also these other places, Google Products and Services? So if I also want to pull up this data over on some other Google website of mine, I can do that, yes or no. I can provide anonymous data to benchmark, to test my site with other sites, benchmarking, yes or no. If I get in contact with Google Tech Support, do I want them to see my data when they help me, yes or no? Right there. And then an account specialist, which is basically a Google marketing specialist, which is basically like one of these people that works at Google that says, well, if you buy this service and upgrade to that service, you get these other results. If you don't want them to see your data, you turn it off. It doesn't hurt either or. For privacy, the best setting is to turn them all off if you care about privacy. And you can have as many sites as you want, a hundred of them. Click Get Tracking ID. Here's a Terms and Service. Basically, no one reads it, but everyone agrees to it. And what you're saying here is that you agree to not hack the site, and you're not going to reverse engineer it, and all of that stuff. So, yeah, I agree to that. Accept. Okay, so then um, you have to verify this, but it's a little different. It can only be verified in one way via adding this HTML code. You don't upload a file like you did with the other with the other um, with the other account and so it's asking 
for you to copy this line of code and paste it into your website. And what it'll do is it'll start tracking your data. Before we try to do that, let me show you this because there's a lot of screens. There's a lot of screens on uh, on this system. And in order for you to remember what you what you did or how you set it up, let me point this out here. You've got at the top. Home, Reporting, Customization, Admin. Click on Home, and in my case, it shows all of the accounts of all of the clients and inside a property. We'll see this in depth in a moment. Then we've got Reporting. This is the screen with a lot of data that we will look at in a moment. Customization. You've got so much data, you can customize your view so that it only shows you the most important stuff. And then admin. We've got three columns here for the account, the property, and the view. Under the account, I can go back to look at account settings. Here's what I turned off, other settings. Um, notice if you want to delete this, you can move it to the trash. It's found there under account settings. User management. If I want more than one person to be able to see this data, I can add them to here. They need a Gmail account, but I can add them. Again, ways to filter this information, any changes that were made if you deleted it. That's one column. And notice it changes. When you go into a section, it changes. You need to back up here. We've got property, a bunch of options here, but then we've got JS tracking info, tracking code. And the tracking code is where you go back to get this code. And it says here, no data received. So I haven't set it up yet. I haven't taken that code. I haven't added it to my site. Once I added it, there's no button that says verify. I just need to come back here to this screen and it'll say right there, data received. It's under tracking info, inside of property, inside of admin. There's another column of view. Again, uh, we don't have time to talk about all of these. We would talk about it on day three, but I will talk about the big ideas about Google Analytics. Uh, you need to set it up, of course. It's under admin and all of that. Home is where you get all of your accounts and properties. On this one, I've got various properties. I want to look at the data. I can click on it, and that takes me to reporting. So I'm seeing here this screen under reporting. Time period the last 30 days. These are the number of hits, the number of sessions. So depending on your site, you may have either consistent traffic or bursts of traffic. And then you'll see various charts. At a glance, we can see here these numbers. 90% are, are visiting, are returning visitors, or new visitors, that is. Nine and a half are returning. With these numbers, again, earlier, like with Bing, I cannot tell you what is good and bad, really, but I can give you ideas. For example, sessions, and if you hover your mouse over any one of these, it'll tell you what it is in detail. But a session is a, a period of time a user is actively engaged with your site. So someone visits your site, and they actually click around and do stuff, not just load it and keep it visible there. A session are hits, you know, 84 hits in this time period. And then we've got users. Well, 76 people made those hits. And that's new and returning users. 
page views? Well, usually this number is higher because a user comes to your site and might, might view more than one page. And page procession is someone visits the site and how many pages do they see at a time? This one says about one and a half. Again, is that a good number or not? It depends on your site. Let's say I've got a restaurant and think about yourself. If you visit a restaurant's home page, what are you looking for? Probably the phone number or the menu, order now. Location. It's location. You might find that information right away on the home page. Or you may find it on the about page. You go to home page, you go to about page. And you're done. You accomplished your task. So two pages per session might be fine for that client. But what if you've got a blog? What if you write every day something new? and they're only seeing two pages at a time on your site. That's not good. They're not reading anything else on my site. So same number could be good or bad for some people. Related here, average session duration. The average session duration is how long did someone spend on your site? Again, if they go, if they go to my restaurant site and they go directly to the buy now, and they buy their item quickly and leave, that's fine if it took two minutes. If I've got a um, e-commerce site and, and I've got average session duration seven minutes, is that good or bad? Again, I don't know, it depends on my site. They're spending seven minutes on my site, on my e-commerce site. Great, they're either spending a lot of time looking at my products and deciding what to buy, or they're getting lost all over my site and can't figure out how to buy the product. Same number, different interpretation. But if I've got a blog and I want people to read my articles, if, I've got a, if this were a blog, I'd be concerned because it doesn't take two minutes to read my blog posts. It should take like five, six, seven, eight, nine minutes. If, it, if they're zooming by under two minutes, they're not paying attention to what I'm writing. So spending two minutes on my site for a blog might not be good but spending two minutes on my e-commerce site might be fine. Next I've got the bounce rate, which is basically someone visits a page, any page, home page, or goes directly to your about page, and then leaves without going anywhere else. They come to your site, that one page, and then they bounce. They leave. 69% bounce rate might be terrible for one client, and it might be fine for another. I've got a blog, I want people to read one article and read another and another and another. A high bounce rate for that kind of site might be terrible. But a high bounce rate for a site where they just have bookmarked directly my buy now and they buy it and leave, that might be fine. And again, new sessions. How many of the visitors that are coming to the site are brand new? Is this good or bad? It depends. Can you sustain your business on new customers? Can you sustain it on repeat customers? That's up to you to answer. You're going to see a lot of this data about what was their language, what country did they come from, their web browser. So let's hear. Let's see here. The most popular web browser for this client was Firefox. 38%, then Chrome, then Internet Explorer. I see here Microsoft Edge is getting some hits. That's Windows 10. Operating system, the number one is Windows. Number two is Mac, iPhone, etc. One person using Linux visited. The point of this information, again, is to is, is knowledge is power, and with that power you can make actions. So let's say something tangible here. This is obviously very out of our scope and complex, but if I could program my site, whenever someone on Linux visited my site, I could program it so that they get a pop-up that says, Welcome Linux visitor, please use this coupon for 10%, 20% off. So I'm enticing people of a specific demographic to do something that obviously we cannot even talk 
start talking about it in this class. That requires your website and programming and such. But your website can be programmed to detect this, and then once it detects it, you can do something about it for good or for bad. And here's an example for bad. A few years ago, some hotel site or something was caught that when someone would visit their site using Safari web browser, prices were a little more expensive. Now, who commonly uses the Safari web browser? If you're on a Mac, on Apple computer. And many Apple computers start at $900 for the basic. So that company figured, if someone's rich enough to have an Apple computer, they're rich enough to pay a little bit more for the hotel prices. They were caught. They were caught. And then they said, sorry, that was our problem, our mistake, the programming error. We'll fix it. Yeah. And obviously, they did it on purpose because they can detect that information. And they did something about it. I'm telling you that not for you to do that, but I'm telling you that you can detect here these different things. On mobile device, the number one hits come from iPhone. It looks like most traffic that comes to this site is coming from either this college or Southwestern College, or people on Time Warner, on T-Mobile. So all this information is extremely valuable to make decisions. Let me switch to another, another <coughs> one of these just to show some different data. So different amounts of data and traffic and right here, Chrome is the number one browser compared to Firefox, languages, English, and we've got Russian. And I have to say, unfortunately, if you're seeing if you're seeing a lot of traffic to your site and you further look at the data, and some of the data is coming from places you would not expect, unfortunately it's probably spam traffic. Why am I getting this traffic from people in Russia? I don't have anything in Russian on my site. Yes, maybe I have some product that is very popular and it's being sold there or whatever, but you have to look at the, at the data objectively. Traffic is coming from US, Russia, and Latvia. I don't really have anything that, apply, uh, that appeals to people in Latvia, so that might be spam traffic. If, if most of your traffic that shows up here is from countries you don't expect, then you need to deal with that. You need to report. You need to report those. You need to report those uh, bad spammers. Um, let me show you some more examples over here. You can't block the actual. Um, traffic, but you can do what you can do is known as disavow links, and we're not going to get a chance to talk about it. But my handout number three has that explanation. On handout number three, it talks about backlinks because let's say I'm getting backlinks from Estonia. I don't have anything to offer Estonia, but I'm getting a lot of traffic from certain websites of Estonia. If I follow the instructions on number three, I can I can tell Google and Bing don't pay attention to that traffic. It's not that I'm going to block them from visiting my site, but I'm going to tell the search engines don't take them into account. And that's much better. It's called disavow. Right, this particular client, you see we have all these amounts of sessions, traffic from the countries. So language is mostly English, variations of Spanish. Of course, it's a Mexican food restaurant. Then we've got country, U.S., then Mexico, Canada, etc., Australia, cities. This client has a restaurant here in San Diego and opened one last year in Los Angeles. And now we're seeing how the Los Angeles traffic is overtaking the San Diego traffic. Okay, based on that, I can then decide to create content on Twitter or Facebook that targets Los Angeles crowd. Or I can program my site that when it detects someone from Los Angeles to do something else, to show them sign up for this coupon, 
or uh, leave a comment. So we've got San Diego, we've got Los Angeles, we've got Chula Vista, Mexico City, Ontario, that's probably Ontario, California, not Canada, San Francisco, web browser, Google Chrome, then Safari, Safari in app, so they're inside of an app. That often means that's coming from Facebook. In Facebook, you can browse a website. It's an in-app browser. So there's traffic coming there. Operating system number one is Android. Most of my traffic is coming from Android. So there's this big shift that is happening if it hasn't already. If it hasn't to your site already, it's coming. But the big shift is that more and more people are using a mobile device for web browsing. And so that means your website better be functional at least, or look better, or look nicer, at better, uh, on mobile. The search engines now also have that criteria. Your website should look nice on mobile. It should be responsive. Let me make a note here nowadays. Responsive web design. also known as um, mobile-friendly. Your website should be mobile-friendly. If it's not, that's going to really hurt your SEO. How do you know it's mobile-friendly? You can go back to the Google tools, the Bing tools, and it'll test it for you. Another way to test it is go to your website on your mobile phone. Have you been to a website before that the text is tiny, mm -hmm. that it's really hard to read, you have to zoom in? Usually that means it's not mobile friendly. If you go to a website and the text is nice and big and readable, it's usually mobile friendly. It responded to the size of your device. If I look at it on a big old monitor like this, it responds and looks nice and big there. If I go to the same site on a mobile device, it responds and shrinks down to look nice there as well. You need responsive web design. Mobile friendly. Most modern website building tools let you do that. WordPress, Squarespace, etc. Oh, that's funny. One person in the last month visited on their Nintendo 3DS. So in the middle of playing games, they called, they went to the restaurant to check the website to order something to eat. This is showing me increments of one month. At the top right corner, I can say, show me more data. And the longer you've got this set up, let's say I'm going to do January 1st. I want to see all the data from last year. January 1st to February, or December um, 31st, 2015. Show me a year's worth of data from last year. Here's the data. Pretty stable, lots of spikes, but in general, there's all of this sort of stable general traffic. In one year, about a quarter of the traffic is returning visitors, new visitors. All of these hits, how long are they on the site, languages, and all of that. So the longer you set this up, the more data you, you can pull that will be more relevant. A big concern has always been when you try to create a website, the question is, well, what size should I design it? And there used to be guidelines and all of that. But now things have changed so much, it's complicated to make a website that looks good for everyone. So that's why responsive web design is the way to go. And here I can see a year's worth of data. The number one size of screen that people use to visit our to visit that client with, 360 by 640, it's a relatively low quality screen. Anything above 720, either horizontal or vertical, above 720 is HD. 
HD quality. So number one is not HD, number two is not, number three, number four, the fourth place most visited kind of device is starting to be HD quality. Fifth place is not, sixth place is. So out of the top ten spots, only three are people visiting on an HD sized mobile device, meaning a lower and lower quality phone. Now, is that good or bad? It, it depends on your company. But if you know that you're getting mostly traffic from lower quality devices, don't fill your site up with lots of graphics and animations and things that slow down. Don't design your site that it's cramped and it doesn't show up on these smaller sizes. Think about your audience. Once you know your audience, you can, you can better serve content to them and then therefore get better, better returns. We'll look at one more thing, then we'll have to end for the day. Uh, again, look at sheet number three. The handouts that I gave had number three also. We won't have time to look into it. But on sheet number three, it talks about your backlinks. And Google Analytics here will tell you all the traffic coming to your site, where it came from. Let's take a look at it. Because you've got on the left side all of these different views. We'll look under the acquisition view. Acquisition is where did we acquire the traffic from? Where did it come from? If you look under Acquisition, Overview, in my case from last year, 60.8% of traffic came from organic search. Someone went to Google, they typed in keywords, they found the client. 61% of the time. Next percentage is direct, 25% meaning someone went directly to a page, either because they bookmarked it, they typed it manually, you know, they went directly to a, a page. That's telling me that people are visiting a certain page over and over, and I can see which page, of course, in there. Uh, referral is the next one here, uh, about 10%. Referral are from other websites. This website did a review of this client, and on their website, they have a link back to the client. That was a referral. That other website referred this client. So those are that's traffic from someone else's website. Another piece of the pie here is social. 5%. So 5% of traffic came from tweets and Facebook posts and Pinterest and YouTube and all of that. And there's a really small sliver. I can't grab it. But there was also mail and other. If you did any email campaigns, if you sent out emails with links, it can track that. The raw numbers are down there. Two. So email is not a big selling point for this client. It's more about organic search, some social media, and such. So I can see, I can see the overall data. I can click on things to go into more detail. I clicked on social and it's telling me you're getting most traffic from Yelp, 2,800. Second place is Facebook, 2,000. Third is TripAdvisor, then Twitter, tied. So here then I'm seeing traffic from these sources, like this one, Reddit. I was not aware of that one actually myself. I was not aware that some traffic came from Reddit. So I can click here to go into deeper detail, what, where, where exactly is this traffic coming from? And I can further do something about it. That was back in July last year, a couple of hits from, from Reddit. So that's, that's one place. Uh, if I look at acquisition, all traffic, channels. Again, this is Google Analytics is confusing. You just have to kind of look at the different screens. There's help on the top right corner. But anyway, under acquisition, all traffic channels, here it's going to tell me all the details. Organic search, direct referrals. And if I look at referrals, I want to see what are my backlinks. Number one traffic from last year came from LA Times. Again, that's another big website. You want websites that are 
they they themselves are famous they themselves have traffic and that traffic spills over to to us that's the number one result number two is eater.com number three unfortunately is traffic to money.com right away I can tell that sounds like a very spammy website and also web for webmasters.org and best SEO software dot XYZ yes there is a dot XYZ nowadays there's not just dot com and dot net there's dot XYZ the point of this is I've discovered some websites that are spam websites that were linking to my site slowing down my site and this would be perfect example for me to take them out to remove traffic from traffic to my to money.com uh, which was actually already done notice there was a spike and then it went away in my handout there's a section there called disavow links and when you take the third day of the class we'll do it in person but on the third handout it talks about there's a procedure called disavow links for bad backlinks you're gonna disavow your links you're gonna tell Google and Bing don't pay attention to these links don't let their traffic mess up my site don't let them bring down my site because bad websites linking to your website unfortunately turn it into a bad website the search engines now operate under guilty until proven innocent shoot first ask questions later they're going to say you've got spam sites linking to your site you're a spam site they're gonna say you're getting traffic from bad sites you're a bad site now I believe you you're not a bad site but Google's not gonna believe you and so you need to go through this process of disavowing links just like we did up here once we discovered that this bad website is linking to us and giving us bad traffic we went in we did the process and then now they don't show up anymore their traffic no longer is relevant same thing here that other spam site once we because we check this once a month once we check it and see bad stuff going on we deal with it but you wouldn't even know why is my site so slow my GoDaddy stats tell me I'm getting a lot of traffic, but why aren't they getting any sales? Oh, I see on analytics, I'm getting a lot of traffic from weird sites in Russia, weird sites in China, weird sites in Canada, and my product is not for them. Now that I know that, I'm going to go through the process of disavow, and I'll take them out so that they don't mess up my site. So there's lots of data to look at here. We're running out of time, but um, hopefully you get started with this, that you set it up at least so that it starts to gather the data and you can do something about it. As we, as we wrap up the class, I'll take final questions and then we'll have a little bit of lab time. And the next time you come back, if you come back next week, this class starts on day one again. Um, we'll do day one, then day two, then day three. If you want to come back only for day three, you're, you can do that, no problem. Question. It's the. Uh, it's also going to be on a Monday, but it's going to be on the twenty eighth. No, I'm sorry, the twenty first. Three weeks from now, because next week, Monday the seventh is going to be day one again, and then day two the fourteenth this week, and then day three the twenty first. And like I said, if you are interested this week, Wednesday is a brand new class. I'm sorry, not Wednesday. Uh, Friday. This Friday is day one of my social media class. Uh, usually these classes fill up for somewhat, for whatever reason, people didn't quite fill up a Monday class. You know, I guess the weekend takes its toll. So uh, 
Friday, though, is often very popular. So this Friday, 9.15 a.m., it is earlier, uh, 9.15 to, to 12.45, we have day one of the social media class. All the stuff that I keep saying about the greatness of social media, we talk about it in that class. It goes from the 4th to the 25th. And then after that, next month, part 2. You don't need to take part 1 to take part 2, but you're going to learn more when you do. And that's it for the moment. Uh, one last little thing is, I hope that you enjoyed the class, and if you did, I ask for two things. I hope that, I mean, I ask for if you uh, would like to continue to learn about my future classes and such, I also post them here. Facebook.com slash instructor Victor C. If you if you go if you're on Facebook and, and you go to Facebook.com slash instructor Victor C, I post stuff about my latest classes and all of that to keep up to date with new classes. Like, like me on Facebook, and you can keep up to date. Are you on any worlds other than Facebook? Yes, I'm also on, on Twitter. And it's um, on Twitter, you're going to see me as twitter.com slash SDCE Victor Campos. Let me confirm that. I've got way too many accounts. So let me just confirm that one. Okay, actually it's just twitter.com slash SDC Victor Campos. The, the, the E didn't fit, I think. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook on there. Those are the two best places. And then of course my company's website, pmdinteractive.com. So I ask, uh, follow on social media to keep up to date, maybe give a like. Um, you can also, the other thing is, you can go to, uh, you can search Google, uh, rate my professor Victor Campos. So if you search rate my professor Victor Campos, you'll, get, you'll see my account at rateMyProfessors.com. And basically, this is where you can give me some honest feedback about the class. Um, you, you will see me at two different colleges, though. Be careful. San Diego Continuing Education, which is this college, and Southwestern College, which is not this college. If you're going to give me an opinion or review or anything like that, please do so at SDCE, San Diego Continuing Education, not at Southwestern College unless you took my class at Southwestern College. This is useful for me. It's anonymous. I can get the feedback, I can improve the classes, and then the bosses can see that I do my job good. So either um, give me a rating there, follow on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Thank you for coming. We'll have a little lab time. If you have any questions, I'll help you out. If you'd like to print, you can print. Mm -hmm.